Is that coming through? There we go. Good evening, everybody. Is that on? Santiago, brilliant. One of the things that I love about parenting is seeing how differently gifted my children are. I was just standing here actually reminiscing of when our boys were little guys in this auditorium during Sunday worship, putting them down, getting them sorted. Now they've grown. Levi's just overtaken me in height. He's 15 years old and he's in grade nine. He's got a bigger shoe size than I have. Ethan, our second son, is going into grade eight next year. And there's such differences between the two of them. Levi is the kind of young man who often starts sentences like this, Dad, I have an idea. He might even have five of them in 10 minutes, and they're all brilliant ideas, and will require thousands of rands and traveling somewhere in the world. But he's a, he's a guy with an idea. He's got a pretty strategic mindset. He came home a few weeks back and said he's been giving it a lot of thought. And if they allowed him, he would redesign the school day so that they could finish by 12 o'clock and they'd get the same number of lessons in that they get now. He just feels that they could be more strategic. <clears throat> He's an organizer. When he has an idea, it's to get the whole grade doing something in pools and then up to semifinals and finals. He is ecstatic at the start of this Rugby World Cup. Not at our result, but the competition. Ethan, our second son, has a radar out constantly to how others are feeling. When a big plan is going down, he's kind of scanning the room just to check how everybody's feeling. He, he's amazing in his connection, his ability to see where people are at. He's also strategic, but in a different way. He, he's our strategic Lego builder, aspiring to be an architect of great buildings one day. He, he sees shapes and colors He's beautifully creative in that way. He, he's also a very well organized boy, but it doesn't involve getting the whole grade to do something. It's in his mind. He, he's busy organizing the different pieces. Both of them love sport. But on the sports field, one of them feels frustrated when he isn't leading the way. And the other one feels frustrated when he's not just in a zone with the task that he's been given to do, doing it with all his might. Just when we thought we were starting to figure out these two Young men with their differences, God has brought a beautiful little girl into our world about nine weeks ago. She's six years old. And so we're in the process of learning how to parent a daughter for the very first time in our lives. We're in the process of adopting her. And boy, is she different to all of the above. <laughs> and we're only nine weeks in. And I sometimes think of the incredible view that God has of all of his beautiful creation, all of his children in the world, the different graces that he's imparted down into every one of us. We're all so unique from our thumbprints, the most kind of obvious uniqueness, right down to our souls and our wiring, the, the beauty that God has wired into every single one of us here tonight. Is, it's it's mind-blowing in its diversity and in its, in, its, uh, in its wonder. Which brings me to my verse for tonight is Romans chapter 12 and verse 6 to 8. Paul writes this, he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. This is grace given by Christ. He's graced, it's like the buckets of grace when he designed each one of us and he took different portion sizes to make the grace that is you and me. And he says, if your gift is prophesying, if you've got a, a dollop of that, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If part of your grace is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Each one of these gifts are worthy of an entire session at an equip like this, but I would like to hone in on one particular phrase in that list. And it's the second last one. It says, if it is to lead, do it diligently. The grace of leadership is an extraordinary gift that God gives into his church. And I'd like to speak a little bit around this tonight. In fact, my title would be the gift of leadership, very simply. Ray Oliver, who started One Life Church, which is still named NCF, very often 
when he was addressing a group of leaders, would quote Ed, the late Ed Robert, who used to lead uh, Hatfield Church up in Pretoria. And Ed Robert said this. He said, every time, or something along these lines, I might be misquoting Ed, but then I'm quoting myself. He says, every time God works, he looks for leaders. When God wants to start something transformative or redemptive in the world, his first step throughout the word of God was to look for a person with some of the grace of leadership on their lives. God uses this gift, the gift of leadership, as a catalyst to bring about transformation in the world. And different leaders have got, diff different leadership gifts have got different expressions, but my guess, I'm just hazarding a guess, that the reason you're here is because you've got some seed of this gift in you, somewhere, somehow. And part of the problem most of us have is we compare the seeds of different grace to what it looks like in somebody else's life. And so compare whatever leadership seed, no matter how big or small you think it is, I might compare it to somebody else's leadership grace and say, well, I clearly don't have it. But just remember the thumbprint. God's given a diverse uh, expression of this gift of leadership. We can never underestimate the tremendous power that there is when people in the church of God stick up their hand saying, yes, God, whatever you've got for me, please water these little seeds. I'm willing and available. I don't know if I'm competent. And the tremendous power that there is in people with the grace of leadership just pitching up week in, week out, doing their best in God that they can do. We will have no way of knowing in this world the immeasurable good that week in and week out, men and women pitching up into kids' ministries throughout churches around the world, the tremendous amount of good they have just by the seed of leadership gift with faithfulness just arriving. And in work with young people, youth and young adults and worship music teams, life groups, elders, lead elders, just pitching up and saying, God, I'm available. We have no idea the transformative, cumulative power that God can take that willingness and use it over a lifetime to bring about unseen change in other people's lives. When God wanted to bring the nation of, e of Israel out of Egypt, he, he first of all looked for a man. And Moses made a lot of leadership mistakes. But he was willing to pitch up day in and day out with possibly one of the most difficult leadership assignments in the Bible. He picked Saul. Saul kind of self-destructed. And then God picks David to lead. When he's looked for a, something transformative in the world, he looks for a person. He starts there. When Jesus came with the greatest mission in the world, he, he picks 12 pretty ordinary guys and works with them. And I, I don't know, I read the story of Jesus' ascension, and I think if that was me, I would have been a little bit nervous about what I was leaving behind. Just a few weeks before, Peter had gone and chopped off a guy's ear. Judas had betrayed him for money, and it, it was just everybody else had deserted him in his hour of need. And yet he ascends just, guys, the baton's in your hands. Always looks for people. When, he, when God was looking to plant new churches in Gentile territories, picks a guy, a most unlikely candidate, a person who was throwing Christians in jail, zealous for God in his own way. And this guy, Saul, becomes the Paul of the epistles of the Bible, pitches up week in and week out, doing what God's called him to do. A whole lot of this book was written by that guy. God always looks for leaders when he's starting something transformative. Second point I'd like to make this evening is that very few leaders in the Bible started out confidently or had it all together. This leadership gift doesn't look like something, and unless we look like that, that's this gift being expressed. Moses stuttered. Gideon doubted himself. Jeremiah said he was too young. David was almost certainly not experienced enough. Peter, as I mentioned, chopped off a guy's ear. James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven and destroy towns that Jesus was wanting them to preach the gospel in. The interesting thing about this, the gift of leadership, as I understand it, is that it does not equal sudden self-confidence or a miraculous download of skill. 
If there are any seeds of the gift of leadership in your life or in my life, that does not equal sudden download of all the skill in the world and all the confidence in the world. The gift of leadership is a grace from God that needs to be developed, which is my next point. But I want to say this to anybody who's feeling reluctant, or for whatever reason you've started leading and you've stopped again, or you're not sure. There is tremendous power. Just sticking up your hand and saying, God, I don't have the confidence, I don't have the skill, but I'm willing to pitch up and I'm willing to learn. Please teach me. When I was at high school, at the end of grade 11, I was part of the youth group in this church, and Guy Feltman, who's here as well, was leading the youth at that time. And they had started a number of life groups, connect groups, home groups, whatever your church calls them, uh, with uh, teens. And they were led mostly, the, those first groups were all led by couples that were married, clearly out of school. And one of those couples was handing over, ne- needed a new leader. And so a guy approached me, at the end of grade 11, and said, would you be willing to lead this home group? It was my first dinkum leadership assignment that I ever had in the local church. I'd had other smaller one-off tasks. I was terrified. I have no problem admitting the reason for my fear was that I was in grade 11, there were some matricules in that group. And I was pretty certain they were never going to do anything. Not, they were not going to follow me at all. I, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I had nightmares over that December holiday at the thought of, I woke up perspiring, thinking, I cannot do this. I'm just going to let God know I'm I'm quitting before I start. Before I fail, I'm just going to resign. And then I'd wake up in the morning, I'd read the Bible, I'm like, well, I'm going to give it a shot. Then I have a nightmare the next night, I'm like, I'm not going to give it a shot. (laughs) I ended up leading that group. All these years later, without much, we've had some gaps, Jack and I, since we've been married, just one or two little bits here and there, but we still to this day, Lead life group. We love connecting with people in lounges. And I still go home some nights thinking, what on earth happened there? I'm not sure that any good was achieved, but we gave it our best shot. Thirdly, good leaders, to my mind, are not born. They are made. The leadership gifting, this grace in Romans 12, for me, is not something that just you're supernaturally born with, pop out of the womb, thousands of people are following you, and off you go. It's made by the hand of God. You see, there is some natural leadership gift that some people have. Often, it's kind of shown, if you take a school context, shown on the playground at school, there are some people, when they have an idea, nobody does anything about it. I was one such scholar. I was one such learner. I tried my best to rustle up the troops to do something. I just, you just eventually stop giving your idea. Then there's other guys who kind of just as a throw a line say, hey, we should, we should do this. Suddenly 30 guys are there doing it. That's kind of a, that's a, there's some natural leadership gift there. But you know, sometimes that can work against you. From this point of view, if you if you just always been the guy with the throw a line, 30 people pitch up, you sometimes never need to think about how those 30 people are feeling. And sometimes you never need to consider 30 different opinions and how we're going to move together, taking it all. And that's the natural gift. But the great gift of leadership, the supernatural grace, to my mind, is developed, and it's developed by the hand of God. A, few, a couple of months ago, in July, uh, I had the privilege of going to Turkey with Phil, so yeah, somewhere, one of my friends, and uh, we did some of the New Testament tour in Turkey, and it was quite interesting. We went to amazing places, but this one tour thing we ended up on for one morning ended up going through a, a Turkish pottery in these caves in the mountains, which are very soft there, and this family-run business that had been there for generations. And so they filled us into this uh, little room where there were kind of some bleachers and the group that we were sat there. And then this old Turkish potter comes out and just throws a piece of clay on the wheel. And in four and a half minutes, molds a piece of, well, why don't you have a look? This is a one minute video clip of the Turkish potter working with the clay.
went into the shop, which was the main aim of us being there, was to buy stuff. And what he had formed was a slightly bigger version of the sugar bowl. And while I was sitting there taking that video off my phone, I was so struck by this idea because it's a biblical idea. Let me read you the verse so that you know that I'm sticking with the Bible here. It says, and Isaiah says this, yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And you see, the leadership gift is like that clay. It's grace in our lives. It's got tremendous potential, but it's not yet developed. And if I selfishly hang on to that gift and say, well, I'm going to do nothing with it. The potter can't get his hands onto it. But it's the most beautiful picture that when the clay of whatever the development is in my natural leadership gift, the supernatural hands of God come in and start molding the gift in a way that I could never mold it by myself. And he starts to fashion and form it. The clay is never worse off when it's in the hands of the potter than it would be by itself. And the hands of the potter mold that clay in a way that it didn't ordinarily want to go. That clay, by nature, wants to stay a blob, and the potter wants to form it into a sugar bowl. And the thing that amazed me is that such practiced hands, that man was clearly doing it every single day. That lid, as he fitted it, it fitted exactly. He didn't need to reshape it. It fitted beautifully. And then that clay goes into the oven and then it comes out to get this beautiful artwork and then it gets sealed and only then is that piece considered finished because it's not just at the end of that molding process. This is the final product. And the leadership gift that God graces into his church is for the good of his church. In fact, the ultimate expression, healthy leadership, is more about God's glory and about others growing than it is about my gift being praised. The ultimate aim of the gift of leadership being graced into people's lives is so that God can have glory and that his church can grow. And God will go to great lengths to achieve this. He molds us. If I reflect on my journey as a leader, and in no way am I putting myself as any kind of great leader, my journey towards my current level of averageness, when I was at school, I never captained a single sports team. Somehow ended up as a school prefect. I doubted myself in so many ways in the church leadership assignments that I had, but I stuck up my hand. I, I took over from a guy leading youth here at this church. So many Friday nights, I went home beating myself up about the thousand ways that I could have done better that evening. Quit so many times in my head. I felt elated, discouraged, fired up, and sometimes ready to give up. But deep down, I felt called. And the hands of God, in most of the time, because there's sometimes when I was kicking and screaming, were in the clay, busy molding and busy fashioning, and he's still doing that work in my life and hopefully in yours as well. God has worked in me in so many ways. He's used other people. I think of my parents, I reference Guy, Ray Oliver, Grant Crawford, Peter Rasmussen when, I moved, when we moved down to Hillcrest and he was leading for that year where we arrived, Dudley Daniel from afar, many, many others that I've learned so much from that God has used as the hands in the clay jar. But much of his work in my life has been in the secret place. Often with the hammer, sometimes with the chisel, regularly with sandpaper. In reflection on myself, one of my outstanding poor qualities has been pride and arrogance, kind of in very subtle Christian ways that we have of masking. And I look back on myself as a young, the younger version of me, and I'm embarrassed at my own arrogance. God goes to great lengths to take that stuff out of people's lives, and I hesitate to say it's gone. But boy, has he pounded a way to get humility in there. There have been times when I've backed off instead of stepping forward, and so much of God's work in the secret place has been putting more steel into my backbone, more resilience into my soul, taking away 
a sensitive skin and sometimes a hard heart and regularly challenging me to have a thicker skin and a softer heart. The Bible says if you've been graced with any form of the gift of leadership, use it diligently. And God is so committed to the process that as we diligently just outwork the best we know how, He is committed to fashioning and forming that gift in our lives. The development of this gift is not for the faint-hearted. Neither is it for those who think that they have it all together. A man named J. Oswald Sanders preached a series of lectures on leadership back in 1967. And they've been compiled into a book called Spiritual Leadership, which is one of the outstanding kind of Christian classic books. And it's on leadership. And he quotes this poem, which is by an unknown author. It speaks to this analogy that I've been using tonight. The author of this writing said this, when God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which only God understands. While his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks. When his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. I'd like to suggest this evening <clears throat> that the development of this gift involves hard work. It involves occasionally feeling stretched and feeling overwhelmed, regularly feeling like your energy spend is in vain. But I'd also like to suggest that it includes amazing joy, seeing people's lives, <coughs> I beg your pardon, almost inadvertently or outside of our best efforts being changed by God and by community. The joy of stepping out in faith in this gift and living in some of the purposes that God has for us because His grace should never go wasted. God will go to great lengths to achieve this in our lives. Fourth and final point that I'd like to make this tonight is to touch on four enemies of this grace. The first one is false humility, which in almost all its forms is a kind of pride. False humility, so many different ways <clears throat> I've seen it and observed it. It's like, oh, no, 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 I'm sure there must be better people than me to lead. That is true. There are a lot better leaders than you and me. <clears throat> yes. But in this place at this time, there is no better person than you sticking your hand up and just saying yes. You see, if everyone in the world said there must be somebody better, it would pretty much be up to Jesus and nobody else. False humility doesn't bring God glory. <clears throat> Willingness to stick my hand up and say I'm willing to learn on the job. That for me does. A second enemy of this gift is the fear of failure or the fear of overcommitment. I mentioned one form of that in my um, uh, uh, story. But sometimes when our lives just feel full, we think, well, how can I fit something more in? But I'd like to suggest that if we helicopter out and look at our life in its entirety, we want to build a life that we'd be proud to stand in front of God having lived. And I'm not suggesting that's cramming it with every conceivable thing that's going down. But if it's a case of sticking up my hand and saying, God, I'm willing to jump in the deep end and figure things out and feel a little stretched and overwhelmed and learn to juggle and figure things out, I'm in. I don't want to be governed by a fear of failure. A third enemy is the enemy of comfort. If you want to stay comfortable, if you want a life of leisure and ease, do not go anywhere near sticking your hand up and saying, God, please use me. Avoid it at all costs. Run from it, but while you're running. Remember that another guy in the Bible who ran ended up in the belly of the great fish at the bottom of the ocean. Just saying. 
The final enemy, on the, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but is prior pain. The gift of leadership and its exercise is kind of a door opening, a gateway kind of gift. But the problem with it, like a, a um, snowplow breaking open snow on the roads, at that thin end, it's sometimes you hit into obstacles that cause pain and dents. And a normal reaction is to want to bail out and say, well, I'm done. That seed grew about a foot high and I'm out. But God never designed us to back out because of prior pain. The end of Revelation, Revelation 21, it says this, he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And the primary application of that is eternity, the kingdom of heaven. But I believe that that's crashing into today. And God comes into my world and he says, okay, you had some pain last year or the year before or 10 years ago, whatever your story is. And he says, I want to make everything new. You've been a bit bent. You've been a bit dented. You've got a few chips. I'm the expert potter. Bring your gift and bring your life. Let's start again. Let's make things new. But you were designed to be used for his glory. This sugar bowl was never designed just to sit in the potter's shop. It was built to be used. I'm closing this evening as we start this equip. We've got a whole lot of sessions lined up and I trust God's gonna speak to so many of us so many different ways. But I feel like part of my task in this first session is just to call out this gift. And I don't know how, obviously it's by speaking about it. But if God has given you even the tiniest little seed of leading something, somewhere, somehow. That there'd be a big yes on the inside to say, God, I don't know what this looks like and I don't wanna be driven by the comparison, comparing it to somebody else. I wanna run in my own lane. I wanna allow you to develop that in me the way you see fit. I want you to paint the patterns and develop the bowl uniquely the way you've designed me to be. But I don't want to get to the end of my life. Having opted for comfort, having opted for avoidance, having opted for fear of failure, fear of overcommitment, and look back with some regrets thinking, man, if, if I'd have just stuck my hand up and done something, who knows what else could have happened. Every sphere of business, school, local church activities, God is looking for men and women who are willing to submit their lives back to him and say, God, please come and fashion, please come and mold me, please come and change me. The end.